Hi, I'm Charles Purcell, and this is The Log for Monday, June 29. So, uh, how was your weekend? I wore pants for the first time in over three months <laughs> on Saturday. I had a gig, and um, wow, I'm fine staying in. I, I'll just I'll stay in for the rest of the year. I don't need any more of this. Oh, man, nobody, nobody, nobody social distancing. Nobody wearing masks. Now, the staff at the venue, it was a beer garden kind of a situation. It was a covered area where, where I was performing and an outdoor area, you know, nice big lawn. Very nice. So the venue itself, uh, the staff, they were wearing masks because it was required, of course. And the tables were set six feet apart, which you do. So there was that. But the patrons, not one of them. I didn't see one single mask the entire day. And they're not social distancing. Hell with the tables. They're mingling and walking around. When they go up to the bar, up to the service area, they get right in the face, right in the face of the staff, shouting out their orders. So what are we going to do, you guys? What are we going to do? I don't know if I want to talk about the virus much today, but we know what's going on. Anthony Fauci gave us the gave us the real poop here on uh, Friday, this past Friday. Said basically we're screwed unless we do this right. And that means you got to social distance. You got to stay home. You got to wear the mask. If we don't, we're screwed. This is just going to go on and on. We're going to continue to peak. Two, three days in a row in the past two, three days, we've reached all-time highs for new cases. Oh, it's just crazy. And the only way out of this is to rely on people doing the right thing. And based on the evidence that I've seen over these last weeks and months, that's nothing to rely on. So I don't know, man. And it's, and it's clear that the spread, this, this new spread or continued spread, causing these high numbers of cases, uh, coming from mostly from young people who are just hanging out in bars and uh, not bothering with social distancing or masks, just the basics of this. So we, we're going to hope that people just change their mind. Like I said, Fauci gave us the straight dope on this. It's the, it's the only way we get out of this. All right. Well, let's see. We got to we got to um, hit some news here. You know, this story, the whole Putin Taliban uh, little pay scheme, little bounty program is such a weird story. If it's true, as reported, According to the New York Times and then uh, I think the AP, it's been corroborated now by at least one other news source, that Putin had this little scheme to uh, create a bounty for Taliban fighters to kill American soldiers. And a, a certain amount of rubles for every American soldier they take down. According to reports, uh, this happened. According to reports, U.S. intelligence knew about it. They found out about it while it was happening, briefed the president, and the president did nothing. Now, of course, President Rrr denies being briefed. I knew nothing about this, but that's one of his favorite little excuses. Well, I didn't know. Nobody told me. But at this point, if we have U.S. intelligence officials on the record talking to the New York Times versus the orange menace denial, well, then who are you going to believe? Seriously. Uh, at this point, it's not even, how is that even a question? Well, I'll tell you, I'm troubled by the fact that Nancy Pelosi is saying the same thing. Now, I've told you many times how I feel about Nancy Pelosi. You know, she's establishment. She's way too conservative for me. I also admire her for being, 
you know, just a boss. She gets things done. And, you know, I've never accused her of being dishonest, not once. I don't think she is dishonest. I think she plays the political game. She knows what she's doing. She's very, again, she's very establishment. There are a lot of ways to criticize her, but I've never, ever criticized her for being dishonest. I've never accused her of lying, not once. Because I, I, that, that's not part of her M.O. For whatever political differences I have with her, I have no criticism of her honesty, her straightforwardness. So she said she wasn't briefed. And I believe her. So why in the hell would they brief the president and not brief the Speaker of the House? I'm not, you know, 100% sure how these things work. Aren't the Speaker of the House and the president getting the same intelligence briefings? I I don't know. You tell me. Somebody who knows better about these things, you tell me. So there's a concern I have. And the so-called mainstream media is being very careful how they report this because so far it is a he said, she said kind of a thing. And so they're careful. All right, I understand that. I don't necessarily blame them. But this could be one of those five-inch headline kind of things. You know, every day's news seems equally important to yesterday's news because we get the same talking heads shouting about it in the same volume. And, you know, I use that five-inch font reference. It's, I guess that's kind of archaic now. But, you know, over the years, over the decades, newspapers would indicate the importance of a story based on the size of the font. So that only very rare occasions, like when I was in San Francisco and the earthquake of 1989, full page, huge headlines. 9-11, huge headlines. Well, if this was true, if, an, if a U.S. president knew about a foreign nation targeting U.S. soldiers and then simultaneously playing buddy-buddy, playing footsie with this foreign nation, lobbying for them to get into the G7 to make it the G8 again, because this was happening at the same time, at the very same time, having these long heart-to-heart conversations with Putin, withdrawing troops from Germany while Russia was reinforcing troops, adding to their troops in the area. If all of this is true, that's a pretty damn big headline. That's a really damn big headline relative to all the other big headlines. And I would be 100% certain and shouting from the rooftops, my own personal headline would be 8-inch font, except for this fact that Pelosi says she wasn't briefed. So I would be shouting from the rooftops and my font would be eight inches tall, except for the fact that Nancy Pelosi says she wasn't briefed. Now that throws a wrench into the whole thing. I don't get that. So that, that takes me down off the ledge and I'm holding back on this. I I honestly don't know what to think. I never take the orange menace at his word for one second, but I'm, I'm backing away from this until I find out more. And if, if we find out more and it looks bad, it's just going to be the latest in a long line, in a long, long line of presidential corruption and crimes. And it can go right to the top of the list, which brings me to uh, today's recommendation. All right, today's recommendation. I'm going to share this on the Facebook page. Uh, Somebody here, McSweeney's, McSweeney's McSweeney's.net. I'm sure they're not the only outlet to do this, but it's the best I've found. Headline, lest we forget the horrors. A catalog of Trump's worst cruelties, collusions, corruptions, and crimes. Nice little alliteration there. The complete listing, so far, atrocities 1 through 759. Several writers uh, collaborated to put this together. It's a very lengthy list, as the uh, title suggests. And uh, it's just a handy guide to have around 
And I'm, I'm hoping they continue with it as long as this guy's in office. It's just good information to have. That's all there is to it. It's not like you want to browse through it like one of those kind of year-in-review magazines. There's, there's nothing pleasant about this. There's nothing pleasant about browsing it. Uh, it's painful, really. But it's a great resource to have at your fingertips if you need it. They've got them color-coded. <laughs> the atrocity key. Red means sexual misconduct, her, uh, harassment, and bullying. Black means white supremacy, racism, and xenophobia. Blue, public statements, tweets. Yellow, collusion with Russia and obstruction of justice. Purple, Trump staff and administration. Pink, Trump family business dealings. Orange, policy and green environment. And uh, as I said, it's quite lengthy. So you can scroll and scroll, but they give you some jumps. You can jump to, to each year, and you can jump to uh, the present time, which is, uh, let's see, the latest they have is May of this year, May 2020. So I, I would hope that they continue this. If they don't, we'll have to find another resource for the rest. Starts actually in 2011. The first entry of all goes back to 2011, February Donald Trump stoked false claims that Barack Obama had lied about his education during a speech to the, to the Conservative Political Action Conference, Trump said. Okay, all right, so there's that. So then we move to March and the whole birther thing. So that's where it begins. And the latest entry, May 31st, 2020, following days of unrest and rioting, Trump stayed silent except for tweets that he composed from within a White House bunker while fires raged outside. Get tough, Democrat mayors and governors, he wrote in one of them. These people are anarchists. Call in our National Guard now. So that's approximately one month ago. There's the whole month of June <laughs> to be added here. So again, it's not fun, necessarily. But I think it's a good resource to have. So there you go. I'm going to recommend that. Speaking of the Orange Menace, today's meme of the day. It's the meme of the day. I've seen this one going around. Several people share it. Original source unknown to me. If you couldn't predict this would happen after putting that man in office, you don't read enough history. The day after the 2016 election, remember people crying? It wasn't because they lost. It's because we knew. Yeah. Yeah, that, that sense of dread, of panic, literal crying. Yeah, it's not because we lost. It's because we knew. One uh, comment below the meme reminds us, that's why five million of us marched the day after he was sworn in. We knew he was a danger to our country. Yeah, feel free to do all the I told you so's you want. You are perfectly justified. We knew. One of the things we were saying was just pointing out the simple fact that every single president, regardless, just every president in history, faces major tests some sort of attack, some sort of military attack, or hurricane or some other natural disaster, an earthquake, or God forbid, a pandemic. Every president is going to have at least one or two huge challenges. And all of us said, how in the world is this guy going to meet any challenge like that? He's only going to make things worse. We knew we knew. And of course that's come to be. And we're living through them right now. The two big ones, of course, the coronavirus and the demands for justice, calling out racism, forcing our nation to address its original and greatest sin. So we have this moment in history. And he's just screwing the pooch. He's just making things much, much worse. And the cost... Oh, man, the cost. Yeah, you laughed at us? 
You accused us of having Trump derangement syndrome when we were telling you this is going to cost human life. This guy is going to cause existential damage. Half the country knew this. So, yes, do all the I told you so's you want. You have every right. Go ahead. Now, there's another way of looking at this. I want to recommend one more for you here. This is from the Philadelphia Inquirer, an op-ed from uh, June 24th. So that was, what, last, late last week, by Curtis Milam. All right, this is short. Uh, this is not long, so I'm just going to read you the whole thing here. Thanks to the president. I am the son of an Air Force Brigadier General and served myself to the rank of colonel. Of my 57 years drawing breath, I've spent 51 of them directly or indirectly serving this once great nation. So, as you might imagine, I found myself on November 8, 2016, more than a little dismayed at the news we had elevated Donald J. Trump to the nation's highest office, a man so clearly unfit to lead America. But over time, I've come to appreciate Trump in ways I did not expect. Now I am thankful that we elected Trump. Because Donald Trump is exactly what America needed. Trump is a mirror, a warning, and ultimately a catalyst for change. Reflected in Trump is all that is wrong with the United States. The injustice of our broken social contract, the crassness of our politics, and the cruelty of our economy. Trump is also the shock that a mature democracy needs for action. To use a timely metaphor... Trump and his supporters are a virus, and they have activated our democratic antibodies. What we are seeing in the streets is the body fighting the infection. America was the first modern nation created of, by, and for the people. Supposedly a nation with no class structure where anyone could reach their potential. But that was a myth. America had classes. Slaves at the bottom treated not as people but property, then poor and working-class whites, and atop it all our original aristocracy of landed gentry and traders in the South, merchants and industrialists in the North. We fought a civil war to end slavery, but failed in its aftermath to establish the more perfect union mentioned by our fathers. What we are seeing in our current moment is not only a race war, but a class war. America must confront systemic racism to move forward, but it also must acknowledge that we have created a permanent underclass of all colors, though mostly black and brown. We are a society where your melanin content and your zip code determine your future. Beginning with Newt Gingrich in 1994, Republicans stopped trying to govern and instead began accumulating power. McKay Coppins writes in his profile of Gingrich in The Atlantic, Few figures in modern history have done more than Gingrich to lay the groundwork for Trump's rise. Effective governance requires compromise, trust, and mutual respect. Gingrich's new version of Republican had no interest in that. He destroyed the bipartisan structures for governing and even resorted to name-calling and conspiracy theories. Over the line at the time, but in hindsight, presaging Trumpism. A straight line can be drawn from Gingrich's contract with America to the Tea Party in 2009, another outsider movement characterized by distrust of government, expertise, and experience. The Tea Party helped elect a rogues gallery of loathsome lawmakers. I'm looking at you, Rand Paul, Kentucky, and Ted Cruz, Texas, Trump's dystopian vision of America is the ultimate flowering of the outsider, populist, anti-government thinking that has metastasized in the Republican Party over the past decades. Under both political parties, America has rolled back regulatory guardrails and created a volatile economy that values the wrong things. Executive compensation packages for publicly traded companies show that our current economic model rewards short-term financial performance, placing little value on the broader social landscape. 
It also encourages risky and complex structures that are susceptible to wild swings and disastrous crashes. When bailouts are needed, it's not the wealthy who pay. The system helped create the greatest wealth disparity in the United States in 100 years. As wealth is concentrated at destabilizing levels, our tax system, according to leading economists, is increasingly regressive, pushing the burden of taxes onto the shrinking middle class. Over the same period, we dismantled the meager social safety net we had. We have reduced access to food aid, job training, and unemployment insurance. Meanwhile, the cost of health care and higher education has skyrocketed, placing both out of reach for many Americans. Now for the good news. Everything wrong with America is manifested in Trump. The hunger for power. The vile derision of people who don't look like you. The cruelty. The privilege. The gleeful ignorance and mendacious narcissism. A revulsion at Trump is causing Americans to ask, how did we get to this place? And how do we get out? That will take time and hard work by well-intentioned people from every corner of American society. But the process has started. What is happening in our streets is how open, progressive societies improve. Fitfully imperfectly, frustratingly, sometimes tragically. But we do improve. So thank you, President Trump. Thank you for showing us what we were becoming and helping us find the courage to confront it. We are going to be okay. So that is Colonel Curtis Milam, served 26 years on active duty including tours at the Pentagon and the U.S. Embassy in Budapest, Hungary. Well, Colonel, I wanted to share this because I think you got something to say here. Yeah, I think Donald Trump does represent everything that's wrong with America. And I also agree with your basic analysis that we've been on this steady course. You take it back to 1994, Newt Gingrich. I think you got to take it back to 1980, Ronald Reagan. That's when the groundwork was laid for this whole thing. There, there's the direct line you draw from the 1980 election of Ronald Reagan to today. So I, I quibble with that a little bit. And I also have to question the idea that we somehow needed this. It's kind of like, you know, an addict has to hit rock bottom. Does he really, though? D- do you have to hit rock bottom before you can improve? Can't we do a little better than that? There have been people hollering since 1980. No, no, this is the wrong path we're going on. It will inevitably lead to fascist populism if we keep going down this path. It will certainly lead to greater inequality of wealth, income, inequalities of justice, backsliding on race and gender issues, backsliding on any progress we've made in environmental issues. Yeah, that that 1980 Ronald Reagan bombshell sent shockwaves and ripples out to our current time, and, and a lot of us saw it coming because there was progress starting in the late 50s and early 60s in civil rights and then moving on with women's rights in the 1970s and environmental consciousness of the 1970s. We were on a path, a rocky path, somewhat slow for many of our taste. But the election of Ronald Reagan and then the ensuing timeline that you draw out, including Gingrich's contract with America and the Tea Party, just throttled any progress we were having. So the fact that the current occupant represents all that is wrong, I won't disagree with that. But many of us have been saying for the last 30, 40 years that somebody like the Orange Menace would be the inevitable result of the path we were on. And we were right. We didn't have to get here. We didn't have to get to this guy in order to make progress. I mean, I love your little metaphor. It's pretty good. 
Trump and his supporters are a virus, and they have activated our democratic antibodies. What we are seeing in the streets is the body fighting the infection. That's a really very nice metaphor. And you wrapped your whole little op-ed around it. But we didn't need to get there. We didn't need to get this sick. We could have saw this virus coming. We could have mitigated the damage. So I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. Yeah, I think he does represent everything that's wrong. I think that a lot of people have finally seen this for what it is, and they're becoming your metaphorical antibodies. But I'm saying we never needed to get here. This never needed to happen. So those of you who've seen this from the beginning, go ahead and indulge in all your I told you so's. And if you're somebody who cares about today and tomorrow and the days going forward, maybe take a look around you and see who's got the track record for being right about these things. History has a way of revealing who was right and who was wrong. You know what? Why don't you listen to the people with the track record? Because I'm not sure how much satisfaction there is in 30, 40 years after the fact saying, see, here's what happened. It takes a lot more courage and a lot more creativity, and it provides a much better service to look 20, 30, 40 years ahead and say, look where we're going. Look where we can go. Look at our options here. All right. Okay, Democratic antibodies, go out and fight the virus. But then once we're rid of this virus, to stretch the metaphor a little further, then can we, can we take care of ourselves a little better? Can we take some preventative action so we don't have to come back to this horrible sick bed? Can we establish in law and in practice, social justice, economic justice, environmental justice. These are the preventative measures. These are the vaccines. This is the healthy eating. This is the exercise. This is the way we take care of ourselves. This is the way we don't ever slide back to this metaphorical virus. It wasn't inevitable. This never had to happen. But it has. So let's rid ourselves of this virus, and then, damn it, let's take care of ourselves so there's not another resurgence in four years or eight years or 16 years. It never had to get this bad. All right. There it is. I love you guys. This has been the log for Monday, June 29. This particular episode is available wherever you find your podcasts. Just a reminder, we're sending out the Monday and the Friday shows to all the platforms. There's a data limit, so we can't do every day. The Tuesday through Thursday shows, along with the Monday and Friday shows. So all shows you can find on the website, charlesbursell.com. Okay? But the Monday and Friday shows go out to all the platforms. So if you ever want to listen to other shows... Uh, we have other podcasts as well that we've done over time. CharlesBurcell.com is your one-stop shop there. Okay. We'll do this again uh, tomorrow. Talk to you then. Bye.